Good morning. So, my today, today's talk is on BSD multiplicity, aka virtualization, although virtualization often refers to various specific implementations. My name is Michael Dexter. I have a technical journal called for testing, and it's great to be back. So, what is multiplicity? It is the introduction of plurality to the conventionally singular model of permissively licensed BSD Unix, specifically. And why BSD license? Well, copyright issues can be very emotional, and the BSD community has done it very well avoiding them institutionally. And briefly on the license, is pretty obvious to all of you, less is more, three obligations, acknowledge ownership, indemnify the owner if it breaks, and use it however you see it fits. And many folks out there have their emotional concerns, but uh, it's generally self-defeating not to contribute your, your work back. In short, shut up and hack, pay developers, not lawyers. So motivations for multiplicity. There is the traditional separation, compartmentalization, containment, imprisonment, and isolation of file systems, applications, and or users. Very useful for cross-platform development, and the initial cheroot was used to build the initial BSD system back in the day, well, actually Unix system back in the day, I'll touch on that. And increasingly the consolidation of systems to save power and resources. And of course, all things cloud. So I will shoot through some historical context just to help explain some of the newer technologies that are here and why they're exciting. So in the dark ages, we, there were mainframes, there were mechanical devices, and come 1975, we finally had familiar one transistor RAM as we know it. We had the hierarchical file system, we had the IBM mainframe precedences, and they at the time had asymmetrical multiprocessing. Symmetrical did not come for probably another decade. And Unix moved to C, and I believe in 72, Popek and Goldberg established the formal requirements for a uh, for virtualizable third generation architectures. And for our purposes, Unix became quite familiar. It was based on C. It was with some restrictions available for your inspection and modification, but life was good. So, briefly on Popek and Goldberg, their formal requirements specified that a hardware virtual machine and its virtual machine monitor, monitor VMM, you'll see that come up dictates that a guest should, the underlying environment should essentially be authentic to the guest and a guest should run unmodified on it. And it should be efficient. Unlike software implementations of a CPU, it should perform most of its execution on the CPU itself in hardware. And the virtual machine monitor should provide resource control to the guest such that it can provide and remove hardware that's available to it. So a little more historical context, come 1985, BSD Unix was starting to make an impact with TCP IP, and traditional Unix on which it's based was becoming quite familiar with utilities we sort of take for granted and have evolved forward rather than completely reinvented. One key point, AT&T raised the cost of academic Unix, which motivated a great many wonderful developers out there to provide alternatives. And we saw the first usable <laughs> Intel processor, the i386 with an MMU, and the Sun One workstation. And Sequent in Oregon introduced i386 symmetrical multiprocessing. And so essentially, this is everything we have today, only a little faster and cheaper. So by 95, that Motivation from AT&T brought the familiar BSDs to the forefront, most of which are based on 386 BSD from Jolitz, I believe, and something called Linux came on the scene, but we'll get past that. So by 2005, the newly liberated BSDs were starting to introduce new features, such as FreeBSDs Compat Linux, and the license itself was 
further unencumbered by removing the advertising clause and FreeBSD introduced jail. We started to see 64-bit architectures we could all afford. Zen came along and late in the game, the Intel and AMD hardware acceleration came along for virtualization and somewhat parenthetically Sun brought ZFF to the world. To the world. So bringing it up into the present, um, FreeBSD 7 arrived with experimental ZFS support and that has stabilized quite nicely. Key point for this talk, Intel introduced and AMD simultaneously, but only Intel supported for the context today, uh, the extended page tables which allow for far more efficient, harder virtualization on, on commodity hardware. Um, the FreeBSD virtual network stack is definitely interested, interesting in the context of virtualization and most recently Peter and Neil introduced Beehive, which leverages the aforementioned extended page tables and, and directed I.O., which we'll get into. So basically come 2012, let's party like it's 1985. We have the 1970s precedences. We have commodity hardware we can afford. We have open source and freely shareable Unix. So woo. And looking at it, Architecturally, there is the underlying hardware context that allows everything above it to take place, and there are various opportunities at each level to pluralize. Um, terminating enclosure, which is just a bare fact, the terminating motherboards for the executing systems, bootable storage, where things start getting interesting as we get into software, the kernel context, boot facilities, init process, user land context on up, and I'll look at different points in the stack and how they're virtualized in BSD and BSD has traditionally provided most, probably the most choices out there. And programmatically, the hardware provides the instruction set architecture to the, to the operating kernel, which offers an ABI upward to the user land applications. That's somewhat parenthetical, but good to keep in mind in the whole broader context. So by layer. Once upon a time, this was impossible. We would never all have a, a, a workstation in front of us on our desk and one in our pocket, which is just revolutionary. So that played a key role in the, all the tools we have today. I'll touch briefly on software machine multiplicity. It's one of the oldest solutions out there, quite inefficient. and. Traditionally, in the open source community, we use QEMU and VirtualBox, but there are some BSD licensed components out there, and the GXEMUL project is planning i386 and AMD64 support, such that we may have our own um, QEMU equivalent in the community, and with new tools like Beehive providing the modern virtualiza hardware virtualization uh, magic that could get very interesting. And if you're a historian, there's SimH for older platforms. From an administrator's perspective, you generally have a file system in a disk image, and you, at boot time, remove memory from the host operating system, and that's a theme we'll see in quite a few solutions. Specify the hardware, um, specify disk image, I think here, booting from a CD and specify how much memory. It's pretty straightforward. You've probably seen that elsewhere. Popek and Goldberg would not approve of such solutions because they are so inefficient, but they're quite portable. They're very useful. They have their place. And hypervisor machine multiplicity. Um, anyone work with Zen on one of the BSDs? Hands up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I did work with NetBSD Zen for a year. It was remarkably stable, and the goal with Zen is to have a nice 1972 hypervisor on 1985 PC hardware prior to, prior to any of the hardware assistance, but that has fortunately come along and been integrated. Like the software virtual machines, it, uh, you generally have a file system in a disk image. You have an external kernel that is booted by the Zen system. 
you deduct memory from the host system, and a key point here, it's not BSD licensed. It's a very cool hack, but in the broader scheme, it's, it, it's limited. A configuration file for your enlightenment looks something like that. Um, specifying memory, specifying the boot image. And it did have early hardware pass-through, which was quite nice. So you could point at your hardware CD-ROM and boot from it. And as we learned at the Developer Summit, there are a number of new features coming to FreeBSD, such as AMD para-virtualized guests and DOM0 support. And there are various parties out there pushing for MIPS support. Cambridge. And honorable mention, Amazon EC2. Um, Colin Percival is kicking around and could probably give a full talk on that. And oh, you did. Okay. <laughs> um, quite exciting, but I correct me if I'm wrong. I can't run the environment on my own hardware as a prototype and then upload. It's getting very close. It's getting very close. Is that through Zen or modified Zen? Okay, so his answer was that in hopefully FreeBSD 9.1, you will have a workstation side simulation of EC2, which would be quite cool for those using it. Um, also mentioned at the Developer Summit is Microsoft Hy um, Hyper-V support for FreeBSD. Again, I don't think we'll have an emulation of um, fully open source Hyper-V on our desktop, but there's definitely demand out there for such solutions. Hypervisor caveats. Some of you may have come across this email post where someone asserted quite proudly that virtualization has lots of security benefits. And Theodorat chimed in. And he had some concerns. <laughs> and <clears throat> the key point for me is x86 virtualization is about basically placing another nearly full kernel full of new bugs on top of a nasty x86 architecture which barely has correct page protection, then running your operating system on the other side of this brand new pile of uh, caca. So you are absolutely deluded, and on and on. So key point, another nearly full kernel. Zen is, again, an elegant hack. It is large. It is not quite Linux. It's not quite BSD. It's Zen. And those hackers out there might not know where to start in this community. And as Neil enters the room, <laughs> along came Beehive, which was uh, the goal of a 1972 style Type 2 hypervisor on 2008 hardware with her hardware virtualization assistance. Key point. And it breaks with the past by requiring these new features, and at the same time does away with a very large amount of software that's required to, say, intercept page misses and other things, which we'll get into. Um, you've probably heard of the VTX uh, on Intel hardware. That's been the virtualization for several years. Extended page tables came along to assist with uh, multiple guest machines and their uh, proper handling of memory and efficient handling of memory, especially for those uh, page misses. And VTD support is PCI allows for PCI pass, excuse me, pass through, which allows for hardware devices to be passed through to a specific guest. As I mentioned, can be done in Zen to some degree. So it was announced at uh, BSD CAN 2010. It works on FreeBSD 9 and 10, and I'm, I'm experimenting with 8 support. Requires those features, which were introduced in the Nehalem processors and forward. If you want to jump into your D message, look for pop count. CNT. I'm not sure if I approve of their choice of nickname there. And EPT generally is included, I believe, in every case I've seen included with pop count. And optional VTD support, and it leverages quite heavily the Vert IO project. I believe the author is here in the room. And that's maturing quickly and entering the tree. And if you're not familiar with Vert IO, it's a more or less standard out there that's implemented in Linux and other systems. Um, is Microsoft using Vert.io? OK. Very well. So not yet universal. Um, 
In all practicality, if you want to try Beehive, it requires a slightly modified FreeBSD guest, primarily for getting it to boot, um, as opposed to execute, which is quite good. Like many of the solutions we looked at, it uses disk images for guest storage. Like Zen, it uses an external kernel and a few support files to get going. And you'll have a boot directory just like a traditional host that's external to the disk device. Um, to get it moving, there's user boot so and starting it with whatever script you want to use. For developers out there, here's a quick summary of the modified components and host components out there that allow for it to happen. There's a Beehive utility, Beehive load utility, VMM CTL utility, um, front end of the car character dev interface, and key point, the kernel module, which allows for all of the leveraging of the hardware assistance. There are a few components modified for the guest, but it's not too, not too crazy. They're pretty easy to keep track of. A kernel conf is generally, with most, module, uh, most um, yeah, modules and devices, disabled because you do not require them and will not be seeing them in, in hardware. <coughs> to run it, you need subversion and an updated bin utils, which is the primarily, I believe, the GNU assembler, which is required for the new hardware assistance features. There are some licensing issues that need to be addressed there, such that if you are a Clang LLVM and assembler developer, um, let's talk to the team and see what options are there. Um, there is a host package out there. Again, a, a guest is built without modules. It's pretty straightforward. And with many of those solutions, at launch time, you would subtract memory from the host. With Beehive, you, in your uh, loader.conf, specify how much memory will, actually, I think you do that in Zen too. You specify how much memory goes to the, to the underlying host, and that frees the upper memory for guests. Um, this is the output prior to it giving you a standard boot screen where you can choose to disable ACPI, etc. And there are countless opportunities with Beehive if you want to get involved. I'm very glad to see that someone stepped up to do a Google Summer of Code project to do biosimulation and get us one significant step closer to supporting foreign operating systems like Windows and Linux. Because things like uh, other BSDs and Linux are open source, introducing them, modifying their boot components should not be too difficult if anyone wants to get their hands wet with that. AMD V support is on the to-do list, although currently it only supports Intel's uh, added hardware assistance features. Uh, as, as described yesterday, suspend and reboot um, should be much easier in a virtual environment like this as opposed to taking on so many different video cards and network interfaces and such that have made suspend and resume a, a nightmare on many operating systems. Currently, Beehive monopolizes a CPU that's given, or a core that's given to the guests such that there are opportunities to introduce CPU throttling and back that down. And be careful with it, but perhaps memory overcommit such that you only use the memory that is immediately required rather than a full simulation of hardware memory or allocation of hardware memory. Um, most VMware type solutions handle that quite elegantly and uh, even more documentation, so proper man pages and the like. And key point there is that anyone can get involved. <laughs> that does not require you to be a kernel hacker. So I've been doing some Beehive work with the help of Neil and Peter Grian, uh, Neil Natu, and I've created a script for building guests to make it uh, quite speedy, and I've built a component rather than world-oriented build mechanism. Traditionally, there's the BSD, free BSD way of building world and achieving your goals. Well, uh, because Beehive only requires a package and if a, a guest kernel, I've limited it down to the key components and a guest kernel. And at the moment, the most documentation out there is my fault. And I hope to soon have an 8.0 guest, 8.23 most likely, and a neat trick like Nano Beehive, such that because it is FreeBSD on FreeBSD, all of your 
favorite tricks will usually work. <laughs> it, is, it is authentic FreeBSD. And during a session, I quickly banged out a script and included it in the build script to launch your guest as a jail, because it's a disk image that you can mount with a user land, and you just treat it like you would any other system. So that modularity is awesome. You can find out more at beehive.org and callfortesting.org slash beehive. And that raises a question, how does it fare in the Popek and Goldberg requirements? It appears that we have been successful. If they want full uh, fidelity to the software, it is pretty much that and, and will be purely that once we have full BIOS emulation and it thinks it's on its own independent hardware. It's efficient. It's offloading most work to the CPU as opposed to handling it in software, which at the extreme is in a full software emulator like uh, QEMU. And the resources are controlled by the underlying host. And that can mean limiting things. That can also mean passing, say, a network card directly to the guest, which is very cool. And that's done through the black hole device. It masks the device from the underlying system and provides it to the guest. Continuing on this theme, and if there's time, I will show you Beehive in action. Um, it's been a long, bumpy road to handle hardware plurality in the system. I mean, once upon a time, like that original stack, there was the CPU, the, the you name it. And handling multiple disks with RAID, handling multiple processing is still a debate that rages on. Handling multiple network links in creative way, ways are challenges. And it's, I just want to point out that it's non-trivial, and it's been a key focus of the projects for decades, and there's still work to be done. <clears throat> Getting a step up the stack into kernel multiplicity, Dragonfly BSD has introduced vKernel, primarily useful for kernel debugging, but one could essentially set up a guest jail type environment with it. There's a quick introduction of what it looks like. And coming up in NetBSD 6 is user mode NetBSD, very similar. And are there any NetBSD people in the house who might be able to tell us a word about that? It's a watch for that 6 release. <laughs> And the software init multiplicity, getting a step above the kernel. A few years back, a researcher and I came up with the MULT project, which pluralized the top half of the kernel and allowed for independent init processes and, in turn, user lands. And what's unique there is that it was fully federated, such that you have your init process in a user land, another one, another one. You can kill the first one, because they are fully equal partners. It was a fascinating project. It still boots. It was built on NetBSD 3.1. And we keep coming back to it in conversations when trying to solve problems. And as we get to, say, federated social media solutions where we all have our own personal site that provides our content under our own terms of service, such things may be very interesting, such that there's a guest server out there that you visit have an instance on and depart. And you can call that cloud if you like. Getting back to the earliest BSD virtualization and multiplicity, Chirut, Jail, and SysJail um, have been around quite some time. Chirut especially, a 1979 hack to create a virtual root directory. A few words on that. It was initially provided as a build environment. It was never intended for security, but it proved somewhat useful. Do not rely on it exclusively for security. But I was first in excited. At, how should I put this? First started using FreeBSD because of Jail, which was built on top of this. And we'll get to that. Um, jail takes that to the next level. It takes a, a this sub-root, shall we say, you're probably mostly familiar with this, but um, gives it the, the appearance of a full system. And you can proudly give someone a little piece of paper with a root password, and they can think they're in charge. But it's a, a very clever extension of the true root. The basic syntax has recently had a whole lot of, of 
options added to it, but you specify where your user land will be, you give it an IP address, you can launch RC and launch it like a normal daemon and server. It's quite impressive. Um, I've experimented with using disk images for storage, but do make sure you FSCK them or else you may take the whole system down while launching your jail. And it uses standard memory management and J uh, process, uh, guest jails are only allowed to see their own processes. I asked PHK, Paul Henning Kemp, a few years back, so what are the limits of jail? And early on, he created a simple script to initiate jails. And he broke for coffee after 64,000 instances. That's impressive. And compared to, say, heavyweight solutions like Zen, you will not be achieving that on hardware from 10 years ago. So it's pretty impressive. And there are some neat things coming down the pipe relating to it. One, it works with Beehive guests. And this week, Chris, gave, Chris Moore gave me a little introduction to what's going on in Warden on PCBSD. And because it is institutionalized FreeBSD components, extending it is very simple, such that through a nice GUI, he has added user management, package management, and uh, ZFS storage management, such that each jail can have its own ZFS store, which is sort of nice and click, click, next, next, finish. So management through here, you can handle the basics, user administration, launch a terminal to the jail, update packages in it, export it for portability. I have not seen in the BSDs any true checkpointing and migration of live systems, but ZFS is a very exciting tool for such things, such that you can perhaps build your customized jail as a snapshot on top of an existing prototype, move that to another system, and go to town. It's, it's quite exciting. Um, he's added uh, package management, daemon management, and the lines between a server and PCBSD and FreeNAS are blurring, all because of the modularity of the underlying system. <coughs> Years ago, another research project was SysJail based on the SysTrace device. It's uh, difficult to experiment within OpenBSD. And this was a full jail clone built on the SysTrace device, which is a, pro a process interception tool like, what is it on Linux, uh, SE Linux. There are some fundamental security concerns from that approach, but it was a very neat, useful hack, just like the original Chirrut, where building a system within it proved quite useful. For a long time, FreeBSD and others have had Compat Linux. And I do want to push experiments like running CentOS on it. There is a, a wiki page out there on the FreeBSD wiki. It would be essentially a jail that is launching actual Unix code. And excellent. breaks on yum updates. Yeah. On the wiki page, there was mention of some of the GCC issues that might freak out. But uh, briefly, what, what's your FreeBSD host? Eight, nine? It's a multi-core mailbox. And what version of FreeBSD? Uh, OK, nine stable on. Uh, Dell 64-bit hardware, presumably, but using 32-bit emulation for the, the Linux Compact, correct? OK. And what version of CentOS? Uh, 5.8. OK. OK, using 5.8 and experimenting, experimenting with 6. Have you found any key missing API calls or anything from Linux Compact? Showstoppers. <laughs> okay. Well, 
one, I guess, showstopper was the Apache Portable Runtime, but could be built without it. That's very encouraging. I do want to talk to you about that. <laughs> so looking forward to the present, um, many, many years ago, Marco Zetz did a talk on his virtual network stack, uh, virtual network stacks, and apparently there's a BSD Talk interview about that. Very exciting work, but very challenging, and handling every edge case has proven difficult for everyone involved over the years, and the result so far has been virtual network stacks for FreeBSD jails, and perhaps someone in the room can elaborate on that after the session. Um, naturally, we'd love to see Beehive support foreign guests, and the, there are actions being taken place to make that happen. Certain parts of Beehive are fundamentally portable, and it may truly be the BSD hypervisor rather than the free BSD hypervisor. That is quite accept interesting for other, other BSDs and perhaps even Mac OS X. I don't know if I saw Jordan here. Um, I'll have to grill him on their interest. I hope to have nano BSD working because it's, it's simply free BSD and whatever works elsewhere should work there. And I'm quite excited about the fact that many of the nifty appliances out there could work on it such that you might, oh, I know there are concerns by the competition, but you know, replace your VMware system with FreeNAS itself or vice versa, and it's wonderfully modular. And again, many conversations come back to malt, and it's haunting me. For involvement, the EuroBSDCon call for papers and participation closes very soon. <laughs> um, raise your hand if you've been to a EuroBSDCon. One, two, oh, okay, <laughs> get a paper in there. They will provide the accommodations and travel. It is awesome. And it, for those in North America, it's a wonderful whole different world that we get little tastes of here when, when folks come over and visit. Um, awesome, awesome, awesome. OzCon is a bit weak in the BSDs despite O'Reilly's early embrace of them and ties to USENIX and all those were the days. You've probably seen the BSD early documentation books. But OzCon's coming to Portland. It's a great event. There are various ways to get in there and participate without paying the full price. There's a community leadership summit, which is free of charge. Love to see some BSD faces there. And Asia BSD Con is coming up. If I haven't emphasized EuroBSD Con, we'll get to that. They just closed the call for proposals on a recent grant offer from the FreeBSD Foundation, but maybe they can be nudged into extending that. Um, of all the countless opportunities described, you might want to just say, hey, can fix this, here's what it would cost, and go to town. Oh, my EuroBSD con, I, I can't go without this. Let's see. Yes. <laughs> oh. Darn you. Okay. Uh, EuroBSD Krieg in Poland. It should be a lot of fun. Hope to see you there. So thank you. That's the core of the talk. I think I have time to do a beehive demonstration. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Ancient, but we may have an answer here. It's certainly not supporting i386 and AMD64 support yet. That's on their to-do list. I haven't talked to the author. It, it depends. If all you need is serial and a block device, it tends to work. Anything other than that, it's not really going to work. But it does support a wide variety of CPUs. Are any of them modern enough to efficiently give a current BSD? Uh, OK. Other questions? Do we have signal? Is there any? Mm. I did, but I've never tried this laptop on such things. Hmm. Anything? Okay.
Yes. I'm doing the keyboard shortcuts. I don't know if there's a software incantation. No. Yeah, I've, OK. I will gladly give a Beehive demo up here in front. Uh, trying that. Let's see. Okay. Fingers crossed. Who is using one of the mentioned solutions? Anyone out there? There was some jails primarily. Lots of jails. What quantities of jails? Fifty. Okay. A hosting environment or internal? Cool. What have been the I don't know greatest benefits and pains in the behind? Uh, <laughs> Are you doing that with ZFS? No. Not yet? Uh, we have only one machine that has a data rate from user storage to your classes, right? Okay, cool. The problem with that, though, is that if your kernel and user are not at sync, it's unusable. And if you have possible jails, then it's all. Yeah. Let's see, we can fill them all at the beginning. But easy jail that you can have. Other solutions being used out there, except for EC2, which is being clobbered in the corner there by a call-in. <laughs> what is there anything that's still not working? Okay, the, the, the other problem we have issue right now is VPSD uh, runs their live contains new windows so that it gets access to then HVM, which means you are paying a few cents an hour for a Windows device. <laughs> that, okay, so the two issues currently are that updating is not yet fully supported because there's the customized kernel, and you'll be paying for a Windows license because it's using some simulated Windows components, if I got that accurately. But it looks quite exciting. So this worked, and here is a Beehive guest, and time permitting, I'll even show how it's built. There is the boot directory, which should be quite familiar. This is largely off-the-shelf FreeBSD with, with the vert IO block devices, various devices, um, the module, the kernel, and it's, it's plain old FreeBSD with a few little build pipes. Oh, uh -huh. Okay, the uh, dash I've done a 400 megabyte disk device. The boot directory is just like the, based upon the, the hosts, very similar. And I have a few scripts to get it going. I can't see on the screen here, that's why I'll be reaching over. Um, this script will just very manually uh, load the kernel module, <coughs> set up the bridge networking. I think on the Wi-Fi here I won't get networking working, but let's do shvm prep. Let's put on re0 and sh run. Actually, I'll give you a, let you look at that first. More Okay, I will walk through this. We might need Neil's help decrypting. For the bridge networking, 
I'm working out a few little tricks on, on why the bridge needs to be brought up after the guest is booted. But calling the VMM CTL utility, giving it a name, destroying it if it exists already, calling beehive load, specifying the amount of memory. Oh, oh here we go. Got the laser pointer. Specifying the amount of memory from low mem, specifying high mem, this can be done away with and just the guest would only have 768 megabytes, that should be fine. Um, again, the name, the, ah, and simultaneously sun, running another command, beehive, um, connecting what, two CPUs? And what's going on here, Neil? The dash G zero PHS. I've gotten it working. I haven't delved into all the knobs to tweak, but fortunately there are countless knobs to work with. And then launching the, uh, choosing the disk device, naming it, and getting the networking going. SH run, and that should look quite familiar. There's a standard boot screen, and off we go into genuine FreeBSD, on FreeBSD. Um, and I'm open to requests on interrogating it. Um, IF config should show our the yeah the VT net network device. Um, the host only has a package containing the utilities and the kernel module. So this is a stock FreeBSD nine system to which I've added those. The Guest has a few loader components modified just to make this magic possible. This has not looked at a BIOS and gone from there. I think Neil's bypassed much of that just to get it working. Um, but it's 99% stock FreeBSD. Yes? Does this start with PF? It should. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, I forget. It's been a while. What do I want to run? Anyways, it's stock FreeBSD. The question was, will it work with PF? Yes, it's off-the-shelf FreeBSD. Um, currently, I.O. is blocking, and it's a bit pokey, but they're working on that. And perhaps you can comment if there are any issues on, on the networking that might be caveats. I haven't gotten DHCP to work through it. That might take a little more experimentation. Okay. DHCP should work. I just need to put some time into it. Okay. Now let's look at the host environment. How are we doing on time? Other questions? How many will run like you and how do you manage ports? Okay. Well first you know, they're tied to CPU cores, such a, I assume you're limited by the number of host cores. No. No? Well there's there's two modes of operation. There's the you can either buy
so both committed was it committed cores and virtual cores are supported? I was setting this up. Okay. Okay, and that's currently in there. Okay, so you can have a one-to-one -one relationship to a given core or have virtual cores as, for as many as you need. Here is a taste of the script I have made available that allows you to run through nine menu options to set up a host and guest. Um, some of these are just housekeeping, like setting loader variables, but Yes. Um, let's see. Oh, you're right. Yes, my brain always thinks. <laughs> so this will reduce the host to four gigabytes of RAM out of eight on this machine. You can experiment with these and just bring it down less and less. I might do a little calculator that just makes that a little more idiot proof. Um, we've suppressed the debug output just so it's not too intrusive, but I haven't found that to be a problem. One could load the kernel module at boot, but for experimentation, I don't yet recommend it. And I, I, the script will put in all these variables and just comment them out for your experimentation. Um, let's take a look at this. So, I'll walk through this if you'd like to see it. Anyone? Anyone? Very well. Um, let's... No nesting yet. And I did get the jail working. I could... So let's give the jail a try. Uh, oh, I think I actually launched it backgrounded. So JLS, here is that exact same disk image mounted on mount and launched as a jail. <laughs> Just go to town. Uh, let's see. It will not be safe. <laughs> Uh, R. Okay. What you're saying is you had a customer in the jail and you needed to put them over to Beehive. You could. The kernel's external. You would want to put in a disk image, but yes, you could upgrade them or downgrade them. But I think for just the utility aspect, one can put in a jail with shell, nothing more, make your modifications, and go from there if you haven't just modified or mounted the disk image. Um, let's see, back to the script. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I'll walk through this with you. What I'm doing is taking the stock user source from FreeBSD from the install disk. I am union mounting it on source-beehive, read-only underneath, and then dropping components on it with SVN checkouts. The result is that you have a full beehive source tree from which you can build the kernel, can build modules, and if you you mount the union mount, you get just the modified components. Very elegant. It, I have Paul Schenkefeld to thank for that. At, at AsiaBSDCon, he sent me that direction. So checking out vert.io, 
And that step simply checked out sources. And I consciously put, didn't put, put press any key. I put the key of your choice. <laughs> so, so four. Let's go through the build of the components. This is building the VMM kernel module and building a very crude package, but does work. Um, if there's a package maintainer here, I'd love to talk to you about how to properly do that, but I just tarred up the components and gave it the basic framework to use with package install. The script will allow you to install it if you are really lazy and don't want to go find it. And let's look at building a guest. So the key parts of a guest build are the kernel itself, which is modified for use under Beehive, and then building a usable disk image with a user land. That's well-documented classic techniques. And back with jails, I had a separate disk image for user, a separate one for, for home. And it, it worked, but just make sure you FSCK them, because one bad image will panic the whole system. Uh, potentially, yes. So use that with caution. And I recall Pavel talking about possible solutions to that and containment. The role of ZFS in that, I do not know. But it's nice to have so many new opportunities in this context. So it's a pretty stock uh, kernel build, but the result will be that directory tree you saw, where it's the slash boot, which is very much like the host. I'm pulling most components from the host. Some are modified. Lightly, I believe. Uh, the disk image, which is standard DD, and dumping a user land on it ov on, over the wire by just expanding the base package. Uh, it was a bit of a flashback to see the 8 series and previous base.aa and ab floppy size images. Like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't know if those can be pulled down off the wire, but. For experimenting with 8, I'm mounting a disk image. I am pulling that from there, source from source, and just keeping it as stock free BSD as possible. And that's, I think, the greatest strength here. Other questions? Comments? I believe so, Neil. So the answer was that the, uh, the guest has a virtual serial console that's provided to the host. One could experiment with, say, Screen or um, the other one, Tmux, and potentially route it to VNC in some way, I assume? OK. And Will, you had a question? Very basic. Um, I, I sh didn't throw the results in the slides. Because of the blocking I.O., there are some concerns there when building world. Uh, Neil, what tests have you run for performance? Okay, Neil's answer was that they are primarily using the PCI device pass-through such that a hardware device is passed to the guest and it's near native performance. Everything they're doing is quite lockstep and linear, which is quite impressive from the authenticity perspective. Um, I think I went on top of my active uh, mount directory but what are we doing? We are. Yes, I still have the, the, the jail up there running. But 
the result will be that same tree you saw. It's quite, uh, rob how should I put this? The scripts are very verbose and easy to modify. Uh, very little magic in there. I didn't want to uh, go with too many variables. Just hop in, take a look at them, modify them. Has anyone tried these? They've been only out a few weeks or so, but trying to get the word out there. Will Backman built it and had some good feedback. I did find that little tiny. Excellent. Yeah. Monkey compatible. <laughs> and that was my goal because uh, I, I sure couldn't uh, reproduce every step over and over to get there. I just scripted the heck out of it. So let's see. I'm going to quit that. Um, well, thank you so much. I do encourage you to get involved, and you know there are countless ways from from documentation to you know, virtual I/O, which uh, is quite sophisticated. And hey, thank you so much. And if you want a demo in person or want to experiment with it, try to break it. Just see me. Just grab me, and I'll whip out the machine and. I'll go from there.